In this lecture, we're going to talk about something called modifiers, but before we do, let me make a quick correction to something I said in the last lecture that, um, as I said it, I, I kind of felt like it was wrong, and then I, I looked it up and confirmed it. So this is the contract that we built in the last uh, lecture, and this is the constructor. For the contract and the reason we know it's a constructor is because it has the same name as the contract itself and so that's a convention that's very commonly used you know Java and other object-oriented programming languages will use this convention now what I said that was wrong is uh, I, I said that uh, the constructor could be called more than once so that is absolutely not the case so the constructor can be called only once uh, which makes sense because the message dot sender is being assigned into this variable owner. So if Alice constructed this contract and then Bob came along and said, hey, I want to rerun this constructor function, then Bob Bob would be message dot sender and he would then become the owner. Then he could turn around and do these things that, that only the owner is supposed to be allowed to do. Um, so constructors, uh, you can only run them once. And in fact, even uh, the way that Ethereum stores the constructor code is, is slightly different. So it will have a data structure that has all the functions and the constructor won't be there. You do have to have a copy of the constructor so that all the other miners can verify that the constructor was, was run correctly the first time it's run, but then it never has to be referenced again. Uh, the other thing, just to confirm my intuition, uh, I, when I looked it up, um, I realized that, that Ethereum has actually changed uh, their notation. And so this is in the latest version of Solidity. Um, so Solidity actually does change quite often. Uh, they tend to be a very liberal uh, kind of software project in terms of making changes, unlike Bitcoin. And so I'll, I'll give you this as a general warning. These contracts, by the time you get around to watching this video, especially if it's a couple years after I've uploaded them, they may not work exactly correctly. Usually fixing them doesn't require a lot of work. Um, but anyways, uh, the constructor now has just an explicit uh, constructor function. Uh, so you don't call it a function, you just say constructor, you can still pass in a variable. Uh, and then it works exactly the same. And so this is just to differentiate it from the other functions in your contract. And it's a little easier. Uh, you don't have to stop and think, hey, what's the name of the contract? Or maybe you make a mistake. Like how easy would it be to go up and all of a sudden you realize you wanna name this something different, but then you forget to update the constructor name. And then now in this case, uh, it's, you know, this is just another function. It's no different than any of these other functions, right? Because you changed the name up here, but you forgot to change the name here. And then anybody can call this function, right? Because it's no different than anything else. So uh, by having it labeled explicitly as a constructor, uh, it just helps with the usability uh, of the contract as well. Okay, so that, that was the first thing I wanted to talk about. The second thing I wanna talk about is something that you tend to see a lot in Solidity called modifiers. And modifiers are not an essential thing. They're, they're not something you have to use. Uh, they're something that you use because um, basically it's going to clean up your code. So a lot of the things that go into object-oriented programming, you know, abstract classes, interfaces, extensions, you know, if, if you've taken um, courses in this area or worked with it, you'll know what those things mean. At the end of the day, all of these types of things are usually about saving lines of code. That's almost always what they boil down to. One thing developers hate is writing that same you know, line of code or a couple lines of code in multiple places. So a modifier is just a little trick uh, that lets you potentially uh, save a little bit of code, uh, make your code more modular, maybe make it a little easier to read or a little easier to understand, okay? And so the way it works is uh, let's consider this line of code that we added in the last lecture uh, to our contract. So we said uh, we don't want anyone to write set. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to create this new variable uh, called owner. And then every time somebody tries to run the set function, uh, we're first going to test whether or not they are the owner. Uh, if they're not the owner, if this is false, uh, then this will throw an exception. An exception will revert the state. Uh, if, if they are the owner, then that's fine. Then it will pass this line of code and it will go on to the next line of code. And it will actually update 
uh, the variable with the new variable. Okay, now let's say that you could imagine a case, it's not the case in this particular smart contract, but uh, you could imagine a case where you might have like four, five, six, ten functions that all have this same line of code. Okay, they're all going to require that only the owner is allowed to run this particular function. Okay, and similarly, you might have other um, sort of, you know, invariants as they're called uh, to, to your functions. Um, where there's things that, that have to be true uh, that you're going to require. Uh, you know, sometimes they correspond to time, uh, sometimes they correspond to who's allowed to, to operate it, uh, sometimes they correspond to how much money came in uh, when you ran this function, which is something that we haven't talked about yet. But anyways, um, having these kind of restrictions on functions is very, very common. And so what uh, the developers of Solidity did is they said, well, let's make it a little cleaner. Uh, for you to add these kind of restrictions to your functions, so to kind of lock your functions down, okay? And so what they introduced was this construct, it's called a modifier, and the, basically the way it works is um, what we do is we take this line of code and we move it into this new sort of blob of code, uh, which is called a modifier. And uh, the modifier in this case is called only owner. And notice that only owner is something that gets put here. Okay. So from a code flow perspective, let's let's start here. So let's say I come along and I run set. So I run set nine. So this says, okay, I find the right function set. Uh, I have a nine here. Then you hit this modifier. It says only owner. So that tells me, and anything that that comes between. Um, uh, the, the de declaration of the method name and the parameters and the opening brace of your function. There's a couple things you can stick here. So you can stick your uh, public-private visibility. Uh, you can stick the return type, as you can see here. Uh, but if there's anything here that doesn't have a key name, like returns or public or private, then it's going to be considered by Solidity to be a modifier. Okay, so it's going to go and say, okay, where are all the modifiers in this code? Oh, I have one here and only owner matches here. So only owners here. Okay, so it finds the right thing. And then the semantics of it is you can think of it as basically taking the code that's defined inside this modifier and it's kind of like copy and pasting it into uh, this function. Okay, uh, so it's going to run require message.sender equals owner and then there's this special, uh, so underscore semicolon. And what this specifies is take the function code, so the code that's in the function that's being modified, and you can think of it as actually pasting this code here, okay? So uh, when you come up to this modifier, it says first do this, then do whatever it is that the function code is going to do. So as soon as you see that, then you start executing the actual function. And then when you're done, what you could do in your modifier is you could add extra lines of code after. So you might do some check that you do first, then you run your code in the middle, then you could have some other lines of code here. Or similarly, you could swap these two. So maybe this comes first and then the require is on the second line. In that case, what it's going to do is it's actually going to execute your function first and then when it's done executing your function, then it's going to run uh, the require because uh, the require will be down here below this. Okay, so this basically says the modifier, you jump up to the modifier, uh, you start executing the modifier, and when you hit uh, this special symbol, it basically passes control back to the function. Now, one thing you might have is you might have multiple modifiers. So you might have three or four of these modifiers. So then it will execute them in order. So it will start with this modifier. It will execute the modifier until it hits this symbol. Then it will pass control back to the function. And then it will start running the second modifier. The second modifier will run until it hits this symbol. And then if there's no more modifiers, then it will run the actual uh, code here. And then it will recurse backwards. Uh, so then it will go back to the uh, modifier that had called it, could wrap up that modifier, which will will then call back to the first modifier if there's multiple modifiers. Okay, so it's kind of like a little stack, a little recursive stack of, of modifiers that get added to it. Okay, uh, if you didn't follow all that, it doesn't matter. You know, on purpose, I didn't. I could have given you all the different use cases um, 
the point here isn't really to go into the nitty gritties of how modifiers work. Uh, the point here is just to give you the high level picture of what a modifier is and what its syntax is. And the main reason I'm telling you this is uh, you don't have to use modifiers, so all your functions could just have this line of code. Um, but if you start reading other people's code, if you go out and look at other people's uh, code uh, in terms of solidity, you're going to see modifiers that are used a lot. Uh, they're, they're used quite heavily uh, in actual code. And so it's, I think it's an important concept to understand a modifier, even if it's not strictly necessary uh, that you use a modifier. Okay, so these two functions are equivalent. Um, in fact, when you compile them, uh, I, I could be slightly wrong on this, but I, I believe that they will actually give you the exact same bytecode, um, whether with, regardless of of, uh, of them. So the anyways, they're they're definitely functionally equivalent, and they might actually end up being exactly equivalent once you compile them down. Uh, you could test that and see, but. Uh, anyways, it's enough to say that they're just functionally equivalent. Uh, they behave exactly the same. All you're really doing is you're encapsulating uh, this sort of requirement in its own uh, little blob, which is called the modifier. And the main reason that you're doing this, like I say, is that you might want to add this modifier to a bunch of different functions, and then it could end up saving you lines of code uh, instead of writing all these things out. This modifier is also very simple. It's a single line of code, but you could imagine a modifier that maybe has 10 lines of code, and then uh, being able to call that those tens of lines of code with just a single label uh, will, will also save you, um, it will save you uh, lines of code uh, as well. So uh, that, anyways, that's the main reason uh, that modifiers are used, not strictly necessary, but optional and uh, useful.